So let's talk about nutrition and fertility. And this is a, a review for some of you in greenhouse management, a review for some of you in plant phys. And we need to talk a little bit about plant nutrition and start with plant nutrition when you talk about what a plant is made of. Plants mostly water. And within the dry weight of the plant, there are, um, depending on the textbook you read, 17 essential elements. Of those 17 essential elements, some of them are non-fertilizer. In other words, we don't apply them as a fertilizer, typically. We have primary macronutrients, secondary mi macronutrients, and micronutrients. We'll go through each one. And the, of the 17, there's three that we consider to be non-fertilizer elements. And uh, these are what we call essential elements. What does the word essential mean? They need them to live. It's required for all stages of reproduction. They need to do what? It's required for all stages of reproduction. It's required for all stages of reproduction, all stages of life. In other words, it's just they're essential elements and they're required to go from, to, uh, to complete the full life cycle. And of the first three is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And carbon and oxygen probably make up more of the dry matter than any other element. And we typically don't think these, as, of these as, as fertilizer elements because we typically don't fertilize with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, except in a greenhouse. When might we fertilize with any of these non? CO2 enrichment. CO2 enrichment. We will fertilize and add CO2 to our confined environment. And so technically, we apply these as a fertilizer, but in the big picture of botany and plant physiology, they're not considered to be a fertilizer. The elements are broken up and they're essential. When, they're, when I mean essential, that means not any one element is more important than another. They're all important, they're just important in different quantities. So when we talk about macronutrients, micronutrients, we're not talking about importance, we're talking about in the quantity that the plant uses. Primary macronutrients, these are what we usually consider to be lacking first. And remember, in a rate-specific reaction, that compound that's missing first controls that reaction, whether it's oxygen, or we talked about temperature not being adequate, or talked about not having water, but if we're missing any nutrient that stops it, that's uh, going to control the reaction. And the primary macronutrients, those are the ones that are missing first. They're used in the greatest volume, and the plant's going to run out of them first. So that's why they're called primary. The nutrient that's highest demand will lack control of that. And those primary macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And you can see 4% is nitrogen, half a percent is phosphorus, 4% is potassium. These are the primaries, and if you look at fertilizer descriptions, they talk about NPK. Secondary macronutrients, these are just as important, but not as likely to be depleted from the soil as rapidly. That would be calcium, magnesium. In floriculture, we add dolomitic limestone, so we're providing a ready source of calcium and magnesium. In a native soil, a, a, a Conventional soil, uh, topsoil, calcium, magnesium is, is usually uh, widely available. And the third is sulfur. And we typically never fertilize with sulfur because sulfate or the sulfate anion is common to almost every fertilizer. So we never even think about it because we're constantly fertilizing it with it anyway. In a, in a regular garden soil or field soil, uh, sulfur is usually, there's plenty of it, in the decomposition of soil organic matter. So we have the primaries and secondary, and so calcium is 1%, magnesium is half a percent, sulfur is half a percent. So the, the primary macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The secondary macronutrients are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, okay? Plain and simple. The micronutrients, and you're gonna hear terms 
in a lot of different ways. Uh, the official term is micronutrients, and it's required in small quantities. Some people call them minor elements, and the others major elements. You'll see that in some older textbooks. But we use primarily in um, what we're talking about, we use the word micronutrient because that's what the Soil Science Society of America calls these. You'll see them called micronutrients. You'll see them called minor elements. And you'll also hear the word trace elements. They all mean the same thing. Of those uh, micronutrients, we have iron. Some textbooks actually place iron up with the macronutrients in the secondary, secondary category with calcium, uh, magnesium, and sulfur. Just depends on the textbook. And a lot of times it depends on the crop, because some crops require more iron than others. Manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel. And depending on the book that you read and stuff like this, you'll see other, uh, some other micronutrients in here. Some people don't include uh, chlorine and nickel. Just kind of depends on where we are in the literature. But these are the, these are the ones that most people are concerned with. So of our non-fertilizer elements, these the plant acquire them through air and water. Photosynthesis derives energy from the sun to change the carbon dioxide, combining with water to create starches, sugars, and oxygen. And these starches and sugars are the energy supply for the plant. And that's why we have to have these things around. <coughs> nitrogen. Nitrogen is part of all living cells. It's a necessary part of proteins. Since it's a necessary part of proteins, that makes up enzymes. Enzymes are involved in the metabolic synthesis of energy. It's part of chlorophyll. It is used for rapid growth, seed and fruit production. And we get nitrogen from fertilizer applications. Some plants have a symbiotic relationship with leguminous rhizobium bacteria, the leguminous plants. And they have a fix fixing cycle in the rhizobium that takes atmospheric nitrogen and provides it to the plant in a symbiotic relationship. But most plants take nitrogen up from some sort of a fertilizer. So nitrogen deficiency looks something like this. Now these pictures are from um, uh, North Carolina and where they have a lot of work where they've done laboratory evaluation of different micro elements in hydroponic systems where they uh, totally, at a laboratory point, completely exclude those uh, compounds. And I'm using the poinsettia slides as an example. You can see that nitrogen deficiency, this is a healthy poinsettia, this is a, a depleted poinsettia. We have venal necrosis and typically a lot of yellowing from the upper part of the plant. Nitrogen is mobile in the plant, so it moves around. Phosphorus, phosphorus is part of photosynthesis. Phosphorus is part of the energy transfer. Can you remember what part of the energy transfer system phosphorus is relative to? ATP. ATP, Dennis? NADPH. NADPH at all those different stages. So it's, it's, it's important for part of the photosynthesis electron transfer. Um, phosphorus is part of oils, sugars, and starches. It's actually a key component of the membrane. We have phospholipids that make up the cell membrane. And since it's part of ATP, it's also part of the chemical energy transfer. Uh, phosphorus nutrition is important in plant stress, withstanding plant stress. You, can't, you have to have it for plant, rapid plant growth. Phosphorus is important for blooming and root growth. Oftentimes, we think about putting phosphorus for fertilizers in our, to get, make stronger root systems. And uh, we think of phosphorus coming from fertilizers, fertilizers like you know, bone meal and superphosphate. One thing that you need to understand is that bone meal as a phosphorus source in a pot for a floriculture crop, the floriculture crop is not sitting in that pot anywhere long enough 
to for the microorganisms to break down the bone meal. So it, it's, it's virtually like growing in gravel uh, because it's, and even in our, our soils in Colorado, our soil temperatures are such that fertilizing with bone meal is pretty much irrelevant because it just takes too long for it to break down. Question. For like bulbs and stuff, you know how you have to, you can put bone meal? Correct. Um, is that, will that do anything or no? Depends on how long the bulbs are going to be in the ground. So They're if you planted them like right now, so like tulip bulbs, you put them in the ground right now with bone meal, for them to bloom it wouldn't do anything? It wouldn't do a thing because no. it takes about five to ten years for it to start to degrade in oh, our right. climate in Colorado. So a phosphorus, uh, a more soluble phosphorus source is more important. And that's why a lot of people use superphosphates. And there are, two form of, there are two form of superphosphates that you'll see in the garden centers. One is simple superphosphate, and that's O20O. And then there's treble superphosphate, which is O46O. Now we apply them at the same rate, but O20O, what's the difference between O20O and O46O? It's the phosphorus concentration. Which one has more phosphorus? The 46. However, I'm going to tell you that the 0460, I shouldn't say O, I said 0460, that 46% is more soluble, more readily available than the 020. It's a different formulation. So when would you choose one over the other? Well, in the short term crop, the 0460 would be more rapidly available to the plant. The 0, 020 zero would be more slowly available to the plant, so it would last longer. So in a, if you're doing a crop that's a short cycle, like uh, bedding plants, you do the 0, 046 so, but if you're using a long-term crop, like um, interior scape plants or in the ground with bulbs, I would use the 0, 020 oh question. Um, I can't remember how to put this correctly, but the concentration that you read on the back of the bag isn't that not the right phosphate you're using, though? You don't have to buy it by like four to get the actual concentration because they're giving you the... What they're giving you is the phosphate or the um, oxidized form of... Um, it's the same for potassium, too. The same for potassium. You have phosphate and potash. So it's not phosphorus or potassium. It's phosphate and potassium. So it's... Yeah, um, the conversion, I think, is around 40. I I have to look it up every time. Yeah, I, remember. I think it's divided by four for uh, phosphorus. But what, it, what that means is it's an actual, the difference in actual P and actual K. But all of our recommendations are based on what fertilizer labels. And the way the, the, the fertilizer labels have done that is back in the mid-1800s when they developed fertilizer testing. It was an ashing method. And that was the most convenient number that came out of their results. And so the fertilizer industry has maintained that, except in Europe. So, so phosphorus, uh, phosphorus deficiency looks something like this. Phosphorus is very immobile in the tissue. And you see the difference in the phosphorus deficiency and the nitrogen deficiency is you see we have dark green veins here, very pale foliage. Um, and so that's how you tell that difference. Potassium. Potassium is absorbed almost equal to nitrogen. And it's part of the protein photosynthesis um, complex. It improves fruit quality, uh, provides for, um, resistance to diseases. However, potassium is not found as a component of any um, constituent or structure in the tissue. It's a critical part of the cytoplasm. And what it does is it maintains the osmolality of your system. And basically it does the same thing in your body as well. Because potassium deficiency is something that's related to a water imbalance. When you have a potassium deficiency, what's the first symptom in your body? Cramps, leg cramps. And what's the fastest way to fix a potassium deficiency? Bananas or 
some compound that's high in potassium and University of Florida created a product called Gatorade, Gatorade and they own the patent. Can you imagine how much money Gatorade brings to the University of Florida <laughs> athletic program? I don't even want to think about it. Okay, potassium is supplied to the plants from soil minerals, organic material, fertilizers. Um, potassium deficiency, uh, it's very easy to pick out. We see it as a marginal necrosis on the lower foliage because it's very highly mobile because it's not part of any constituent. So it's free in the cytoplasm. It can be migrated to where it's demand. So we see deficiency in old tissue first, and it's typically a marginal burn, just like this, and it's in one of those ones that you can fix immediately. Just add potassium. Calcium is the first of the secondary primaries. It's part of the cell wall structure gives the plant strength, gives the plant architecture. It's part of the cell walls. It's, um, we can use it to a a interact with some alkaline salts and stuff like that. And the primary source of, of calcium, things like dolomitic lime, gypsum, and superphosphate has a lot of calcium in it as well. Because the phosphate is an anion, it's gotta have calcium, it's gotta have, all of our fertilizer have to have a balance of, of anions and cations. Um, calcium uh, is an important nutrient in our uh, crop production. Uh, we see uh, calcium deficiency quite often as a marginal burn on poinsettias. This time of year you'll see calcium deficiency on your garden tomatoes because calcium is translocated in the plant. It's not mobile once it's incorporated into the tissue because it's part of the architecture. So. Its movement in the plant relies on mass flow. If you don't have uniform water translocation through the plant, you get calcium deficiency, and where you have calcium deficiency, you have inefficient cell wall structure. And we see that in tomato fruit with a system called, or a symptom called blossom end rot. A lot of people think of it as a disease, but it's actually a physical or a nutritional defect where there's not enough calcium in the system to let the, the uh, tomato fruit expand. Tomatoes, tomato fruit, has absolutely no stomata. So it's reliant on root pressure to fill that fruit. A poinsettia bract has very, very few stomata. So again, it's relying on root pressure to, f to fill that bract at a uniform rate. So the trick is, when you have bract formation, just like the trick is with a tomato fruit, is uniform watering. Wet dry cycles is what really causes blossom end rot. Over in the left-hand picture, we see a crinkled leaf. And that's a very, that's a very <coughs> obvious uh, sign of calcium deficiency early in plant growth. Again, calcium is required for good, strong cell wall development. And if it's not in the plants fast enough, the cell, wall is, the cell walls are not being laid down fast enough in the vascular system, and the intervenal spaces are growing faster than the veins. Therefore, it's giving us what I call a Venetian blind effect. It's like pulling a string and tightening it up. And this is very common that we see this in plants that are not being watered uniformly during the heat of the summer, early in the fall, and where the plants are not getting enough water, not getting enough calcium nutrition. Some growers will apply calcium as a foliar spray with calcium acetate or calcium chloride. It will eliminate some of these problems, especially bract edge burn, but the best thing to do is use a fertilizer that provides a ready source of calcium, and that's calcium nitrate. Magnesium. Magnesium is uh, part of the chlorophyll molecule. It actually sits in the middle of the chlorophyll molecule. The chlorophyll molecule itself, ex itself is what we call a heme structure. Heme structures are common throughout biology. In a mammalian system, the heme structure 
has iron in the middle, which makes it hemoglobin, roughly similar. But that's the kind of structure we have. And that's what makes blood red, because it's iron. Plants are green because it's magnesium. Now, the heme molecule is not, they're not the same molecules, but it's, they're in the same family of chemistry. So it's essential for photosynthesis. It's part, it's a divalent cation. It means it's got two positive charges and it activates a lot of enzymes. In other words, what it does is those divalent charges in the tertiary structure of a protein, they pull it together and hold it in the proper configuration so the enzyme is activated. We get it from soil minerals, uh, fertilizers, dolomitic limestone, um, Again, in a floriculture situation, we typically have to add it. And again, like potassium, you saw that black burning, that leaf burning, in we see this leaf yellowing, and actually it starts to go, migrates into the vein, in, intervenal area on the older tissue, which tells you that it is a mobile cation. And we see this in common on chrysanthemums, and you can see it in these older leaves. On potted mums, where we want to, we want to have healthy plants, we'll add magnesium as a, as a fix. But in a cut flower, we probably typically don't have to worry about it because the magnesium is being depleted, being migrated up to the bloom. And we're going strip to strip the foliage anyway. So it doesn't matter. But this is a, this is a very easy fix um, when you start seeing magnesium deficiency because the fastest magnesium source that you can get is Epsom salts. And you can buy it anywhere, including the drugstore. So. Sulfur. Sulfur is an essential uh, for s uh, specific proteins, enzymes. It's in chlorophyll formation, root growth, seed production. Um, sulfur deficiency you will only see sulfur deficiency, more than likely, you'll only see sulfur deficiency in a laboratory situation where they have created a sulfur deficiency with this plants, these plants. Um, actually, there is some research going on at Nebraska with rose production on sulfur deficiency, but it's typically very rare. We see a uniform leaf yellowing throughout the system. And about the only way you can really tell that you have a sulfur deficiency is with a laboratory analysis. Yes. One other way, uh, physiology, I think they told us that to actually see it, they had to grow it out, the plant, produce seed, then grow that seed out in a, in a similar situation where it had no sulfur at all, and then they would finally see it after that seed was grown out. It's, very, it's a very challenging test to, give, to really get a true sulfur deficiency. So it's very uncommon, and like I said, this is probably the only time you'll ever see it. Iron, on the other hand, which is the first of the ma uh, microelements, is you'll see this pretty regular. It's part of formation of chlorophyll. We get iron from the soil, iron sulfate, and chelates. And it's a very drastic, full intervenal chlorosis. Um, it uh, doesn't have the modeling that you would see in, in the magnesium deficiency. Um, iron is critical in a lot of our pH uh, plants that are adapted to low pH. If you grow them in a high pH, the iron isn't relatively av readily available. Therefore, we see iron deficiency there. Um, also, we see iron deficiency quite regularly in cold soils because cold soil slows down microbial activity and to keep the iron in the right form right formulation that for the plants to take it up, microbial activity is very common. So if we oversteam our soil and kill all the bugs, and then we have cold soil on, iron, on plants such as azaleas and crops like that that require high levels of iron, we're going to see iron deficiency. Manganese. It's a divalent cation. It's part of uh, carbohydrates, part of, um, of um, a lot of our different enzymes, part of nitrogen metabolism. Zinc, 
Uh, zinc is uh, important for the transformation of carbohydrates, for the consumption of sugars. Uh, zinc is also uh, part of um, the process. It's an, another one of those divalent cations that's required for the metabolism of gibberellins. Okay. Now, the gibberellins is a plant hormone that causes the cell walls to elongate and stretch. So a zinc deficiency actually looks like real close, real close internode development. Almost so much that you see at the end of the plant tips a uh, rosetting, almost like a rosette of leaves. And this is common in tree crops, primarily things like pecans and walnuts, where they're growing, trying to grow on soil that's fairly alkaline and the zinc isn't available. There's plenty of zinc in the soil, but the zinc just isn't available because of the pH. However, if you see a clustering, a real tight internode, um, lack of internode expansion in a greenhouse, it's more than likely it's not because of zinc deficiency, but because you have an aphid infestation. Because aphids uh, are phloem feeders, and that constant uh, damage in the uh, sensitive part of the rapidly expanding shoot tip, aphid causes the same damage. So it's, but usually you can see that there's aphids there. This is a zinc deficiency. You can see the erratic elongation because of the lack of um, gibberellins to provide that, that um, uh, advancement. Some people confuse this with uh, calcium deficiency, but with calcium deficiency, it's always more uniform. And you see how in this growing, we have this disruption here uh, at this leaf expansion. So it just shows that it's more erratic. So it's usually almost always a curled intervenal development, whereas calcium deficiency is more uniform. A lot of these visual cues comes with experience. The best thing to do is to maintain a database of um, laboratory analyses. You're not going to do it every week, but you're going to do it on a regular basis. Copper is part of reproductive growth, um, parts of metabolism of proteins. Boron uh, is important in um, cytokinin manufacture. Uh, a lack of boron, we often see um, no apical dominance, and the plants form what's called a witch's broom. Lots of little spikes of stems and such as that. And we actually see this in Colorado pretty regular because our water is so, our, our mountain runoff water is so clear that it doesn't have a lot of boron in it. So in Colorado, we typically have to add boron to our fertilizer recipes. Um, and the easiest thing to use is borax. And where do we buy borax? In the grocery store, in what form? Laundry detergent. And the laundry detergent brand is? Borax or 20, well, when I was a kid, it was uh, 20 Mule Team Borax. For the, that was a sponsor of a TV show called um, Wagon Train. And the um, Wrangler on the rounder that was on Wagon Train, it was his first TV performance. His name was, he was in his early 20s, Clint Eastwood. Little trivia for the day. Dirty Harry. Huh? Oh, this is a long time before he had Dirty Harry. This is even before he became uh, the man with no name in the uh, spaghetti westerns. So, molybdenum. Everybody say it together. Molybdenum. <laughs> it's, it's one of those challenges. Molybdenum, its key role in plants is it's an activator of an enzyme called nitrate reductase. Nitrate reductase. And we get molybdenum for our fertilizers and soils. And actually, we see molybdenum deficiency pretty common in crops like poinsettias. If you're, not, if you're using uh, very pure, very clean fertilizers that don't have a molybdenum trace element in them, we'll see molybdenum deficiency in poinsettias primarily in the early season. And we see it as a marginal necrosis on rapidly growing tissue. And uh, we add that as a supplement. And uh, the way that we determine this 
is we actually have to go and do a, a tissue analysis of the surrounding tissue, cut off the burned tissue, analyze that, and you'll see that it's got a high level of nitrate versus uh, nitrogen-containing compounds. So I have an excess of nitrate salt. So that burn that we see is actually a uh, salt burn. Um, molybdenum deficiency is, is pretty extreme in this particular case where you can see that as if we were to analyze that leaf there, it would be high levels of nitrate, so it's actually a salt burn. Chloride, um, part of plant metabolism. Chloride is common in the soil. Chloride is different than chlorine. What's the difference between chloride and chlorine? One is the ionic form, it's got a charge. Chlorine is a molecule in its natural state. Chlorine gas is two molecules of chlorine together. But chloride is what we're looking at. Nickel, um, not an easy thing to see. When we talk about fertilizers, though, and talk about plant production in the greenhouse, we need to talk about what kinds of forms of fertilizers available to the plant. Remember, we're in a totally artificial environment in the greenhouse. Okay? We're not growing in the soil. We've got this little bitty pot or this hydroponic system or something like that. And we need to think about how our nitrogen is available. And there's three forms of nitrogen that we use in plants. And those of you in greenhouse management probably remember me saying that if you don't take anything else from this class, I want you to remember this one slide. And it's the same here. I get more calls on this issue in the greenhouse industry than any other issue. There are three forms of nitrogen. We have ammoniacal nitrogen, which is a cation, nitrate nitrogen, which is an anion, urea nitrogen, which is what we call an organic form. Now, this is organic in that it has a carbon. Does that mean it's an organic fertilizer? Well, it depends on who you're talking about. The chemists say yes, the organic farmers. So there's conventional forms of urea and organic forms of urea. But I'm talking about it being organic in that it's got carbon. Now, the plant doesn't take up urea takes ammonium or nitrate. So you, if we apply urea to our system, we have to have microbial activity to break it down to a form that the plant can take up. The first stage of breakdown from urea is ammonium, which is a cation. Rule of thumb, in a container system for greenhouse production, we should always avoid fertilizer that has more than 40% ammoniacal nitrogen in its ratio. Cheap fertilizers, they just say it's got nitrogen in it. It doesn't tell you whether it's got urea. It doesn't tell you where the nitrogen is coming from. Urea is the cheapest form of conventional nitrogen, followed by ammonium. Nitrate nitrogen is the most expensive. That's what it means it cost to, to generate these in petroleum costs. Because to manufacture urea, they take it out of the atmosphere with a, with a combustion process using natural gas to create, create that. If our, we get up to the 40% range and the pH is lower than 5.5 or the soil temperature is cold or it's overly wet, that accentuates uh, ammonium toxicity. So how do we avoid that problem? Nitrate is taken up by the pl plants, very mobile in the plant, can be, can be stored, can be stored at high concentrations without giving us any toxic effects. Now, the plant will take up ammonium forms, but it, the plant is more likely to become burned by ammonium. And it's best, most, most of the time, the plant would prefer to take it up, being anthropomorphic, the plant would prefer to take it up as nitrate but it will take it up as ammonium. Now, this conversion of ammonium to nitrate is dependent on soil temperature and soil pH. If the pH is too low, the, the bugs don't work. If the temperature is too low, the bugs don't work. So cold, sterile soils are more susceptible to ammonium toxicity. 
So ammonium toxicity, we see a rolling of the tissue, the, the leaves roll. You get chlorosis and eventually necrosis with the marginal burning, and then you'll even see tips of the roots being burned back. But this is what really happens in, the, in a small volume. And this is Newman's interpretation of the, of the rhizosphere. We have soil colloids and we have uh, pore space. And a root grows into our pore space and it takes up this nitrogen. The nitrogen is an anion, which means it has a negative charge. For that system to maintain a balance, it's got to give off a negative charge, which it gives off as a hydroxyl group. Now, what happens to the pH? pH goes up. Okay. Now, let's take this whole same scenario. Root grows into the, into the soil, and it takes up an ammonium, which is a cation, which means it has a positive charge. To take up the positive charge, it's got to excrete a cation, which is a hydrogen ion, and the pH goes down. Okay. Now, what that means is if we use heavy ammoniacal forms, the pH goes down, and we have such a small volume that we're using a fertilizer to, in fact, drive the pH down. And that's what gives us ammonium toxicity. So, pH, any cation, any anion that the plant takes up is going to impact the pH of the rhizosphere. However, which element is taken up in the greatest volume? Nitrogen. Therefore, nitrogen is going to impact the pH more than any other uh, element. So it has the greatest effect. So we look at our fertilizers. 2177 is 100% ammonium. 202020, which is what the manufacturers call greenhouse general fertilizer. And then we have 201020, then we have 15515. Now, 100 to 22, this is the cheapest, this is the most expensive, because this has the highest level of nitrate. Nitrate is most expensive. And the 15515 has been formulated with calcium and, and magnesium. We call it 15515 CalMag. 201020 is the general purpose fertilizer that we recommend for most crops. Triple 20 was designed by Ray Sheldrake and Jim Boodley at Cornell University in the early 1960s. The early 1960s, when we first developed the, what we now call the Cornell mix, also had topsoil blended into it. Now, the topsoil has a high percentage of clay, which provides what we call a buffering effect. And that buffering effect required it to be in the ammoniacal, some more to be in the ammoniacal form. And we used high volumes. Ray Sheldrake was eventually hired by the W.R. Grace Company, which created the Peters fertilizer line. And Peters fertilizer line recommended you fertilize to 15% leach with 400 parts per million 202020 because they sold fertilizer. We now recommend 201020 and recommend fertilizing to marginal leach growing better plants. So that's where some of these formulations came from. If you're using a Sub-irrigation system, like you're recycling your water or doing ebb and flood irrigation, 50%. That's all the more you need. Most crops, we use a one-to-one -one nitrate nitrogen ratio to potash. Okay, Matthew said earlier, potash is different than K, K alone, because potash is the normal number. Except for crops like azaleas, they want more 
nitrogen, and the azaleas actually prefer or preferentially take up ammoniacal nitrogen because it's an acid-loving crop, and we use that ammoniacal form to keep it in acid form. Uh, same thing with this uh, Lacier begonias. Foliage plants, 1.5 to 1. Carnations is the re reverse, and cyclamen is reverse as well. What's that's important is you know that you can't use the same fertilizer regimen for every crop. P205, or phosphate, we typically apply that as a soil-based medium. Uh, we can apply it as phosphoric acid. Um, some growers, will, some manufacturers will put it in the, in the mix, but you don't know how much is there unless you analyze every group. It also uh, leaches out pretty quick. Um, if it's a long-term crop, we need to add it. So typically, we add P205 at 50% of the rate of nitrogen. So one, one, half, one nitrogen, one half P, one potassium. Think of that as 20, 10, 20. And the 15, 5, 15 modern fertilizer is more like 3, 1, 3. And these are the, these are the common formulations that we see in the greenhouse industry. Secondaries, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, one of the important things to do is to evaluate how much calcium and magnesium are already present in the water. If your, irrig if your irrigation water has a lot of calcium and magnesium in it, why pay for a fertilizer when you're already paying for the water? Take a test your water. We typically want a ratio of three parts calcium to one part magnesium. And this is in milli equivalents per liter. If you're doing parts per million, it's five to one. What's the difference between a milli equivalent per liter and a part per million? Anybody know? Milli equivalent refers to the molar value. Molar value versus this is mass. Matthew, there's some people listening to this that been smack him. Okay. So the alkalinity of water also gives us some additional problems too. We need to evaluate these are water test pictures where the alkalinity is a milli equivalence of um, carbonate. And usually th that's the carbonates are the uh, anions. The cations are usually calcium, magnesium, and sodium. You need to look at these ratios in your water test to see where you're having results or not. This is where you start fine tuning and designing your um, crop production scenario. The cut flower growers are very precise. Bedding plant growers pretty much are like a shotgun. And there are other growers that, uh, other kinds of growers that scrutinize every single product. Limestone, um, regular limestone is calcium carbonate. That's what we call calcitic. Dolomitic limestone is a blend of calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. We have a limestone quarry north of town up at Livermore. And their primary product is calci calcitic or calcium carbonate for the construction in, in industry. Uh, there's a, a band of dolomitic limestone. They usually consider that waste, but they do sell it for agricultural purposes. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. It's another good calcium source. Dolomitic limestone is carbonate. These raise the pH of our potting soil. So we blend those primarily to raise the potting soil, the pH of our potting soil. Uh, but you, you're doing it also for calcium magnesium nutrition. If you don't want to change the pH of your potting soil, but you need calcium, we use calcium sulfate. Drywall, okay? That's what gypsum is. And this provides a calcium source without changing the pH of our potting soil. Epsom salts uh, is what we use for um, magnesium. It's readily available. One pound per 100 gallons. Calcium nitrate, again, is readily available. Uh, we typically add that at about 200 parts per million calcium, which is one pound per 100 gallons. Sulfur, magnesium sulfate, gypsum, calcium sulfate. All of our fertilizers have some sulfur. If we're using sulfuric acid as our acidification solution, that's a sulfur source as well. But this is not 
you don't apply sulfuric acid to get sulfur. And one at 20 to 30 parts per million. Micronutrients, almost all of our fertilizers have uh, micronutrients in them. Um, some have no micronutrients, some are very pure. Uh, the best thing to do is to read the label. Your better fertilizers are gonna come with a full spectrum analysis of what the label is going to say. High pHs, though, make some of the micronutrients low, uh, less available, so it requires some chelates. Some of the micronutrient compounds we use, uh, one of the common ones is a product called STEM, soluble trace element mix. Uh, STEM is like shooting our plants with a shotgun. Okay. We're giving it everything that we know it's going to need, whether it needs it or not. But it's the most efficient thing to do. Fritted trace elements, you'll see it as FTE. This is actually where they take molten glass, blend the micronutrients into the molten glass, cool it, fracture it, shatter it, and grind it into a powder. And as the glass erodes in the soil system, it's slowly available very slowly available. Then there's all kinds of one other common that, uh, compounds out there. One of the things that we use in Another greenhouse is probably one of the heaviest things we use are fertilizer injectors. And injectors are a mechanical tool that we use to take a fertilizer concentrate and in introduce it into our irrigation water so we can do a constant feed. Um, any other application of uh, fertilizer, uh, if we to apply it as a dilute measure, or without a fertilizer injector, we'd require such a volume of system that it would be very difficult. Injectors, we use them primarily for fertilizers. You can use them for pesticides You can um, under limited conditions. However, the problem when you use it as a pesticide, to apply a pesticide, the minute you use any tool, any device to apply a pesticide, that tool now becomes a pesticide application device and has to be handled only by pesticide applicators. So typically we, re, uh, we resist using injectors, except certain kinds of products, as pesticide applicators. Plant growth regulators, believe it or not, if you use a plant, as a plant growth regulator, plant growth regulators are classified as pesticides, so it jumps back up here again. Wetting agents, things to make the water, uh, uh, make your potting soil, uh, disinfectants. Uh, disinfectants are quasi-pesticides, but we can get away with that. And maybe mineral acids or something like that for acidifying your water. And so somewhere I have a battery for my remote. Hmm? <laughs> what? How much teams do you carry? I'm not usually that much. I was cleaning out my car because my wife is going to use my car and I don't want her stealing my change. <laughs> <laughs> my boys are very unhappy with me because I'm taking their car to Montana because it's a Subaru and gets better gas mileage. And they're saying, but, but. I said, but, but nothing. I'm paying for the insurance and the title. Did say, did you buy the car? Yeah. That's your car. That's my car. Actually bought the car, bought this car from our priest. It's the first car I ever bought. The <laughs> first car I ever bought that came with its, uh, with a 10 page confession. <laughs> Wrong battery. Yeah, the boys uh, had a little bumper scruncher with it. They scratched uh, part of the bumper on a uh, parking lot barrier. And I uh, said, oh, confessional. OK, back to injectors. Injectors, one of the challenges with an injector is um, figuring out how much to, how much product to put in it. 
And those of you that had greenhouse management, we spent quite a bit of time in one of our lab sections on calculating injector uh, calculations. Um, injectors are, are typically sold as, um, as a, sold in a ratio. We have one to, one, one to 50, one to 100, one to 200, one to 500. Um, these are the ratios, and what it refers to is how much fertilizer or concentrate of whatever product it may be, fertilizer, uh, disinfectant, stuff like this, is introduced to the water. So like a 1 to 50 is a 2%, 1 to 500 is a 0.2%. Uh, what th this really works out is if you have a stock tank, like five gallons that of concentrate, and it's 1 to 100, that means that that stock tank provides enough fertilizer or chemical to produce 500 gallons of mixture. Um, and it's pretty simple. A lot of our injectors are adjustable. We can adjust them between these rates, but a lot of them are just typically fixed. So it, how's it work? So a 1 to 100 injector, we get 99 parts of water go this way, one part goes this way, making 100 parts. So clear water comes in. And that's basically all the more, com more complicated it needs to be. So what kind of injectors do we have? Uh, we basically have two types of injectors. The first one that we call our Venturi injectors, and a couple brand names are Hoson, Siphon-X. Then we have positive displacement injectors, which are water pumps or mechanical pump. Some common names are Dosatron, Dosmatic, Anderson, Smith, Giwa. Those are a couple of different kinds. And we'll talk about each individual product uh, and how they are work for us. The first one is, is a Venturi in injector. Now those of us that are uh, remember carburetors, uh, carburetor is actually a Venturi uh, device for introducing fuel and air into an engine. Uh, they're simple. They have no moving parts. They're cheap. They inject at a constant rate. And they use the pressure that moves through the water line. It hits a constricted area. The constriction zone speeds up the water. And it's got a little orifice with a check valve. And as it the, speedy, the water speeds up across that orifice, it pulls a slight vacuum. And as it pulls that vacuum, it draws up the chemical or the fertilizer through the feed line. We can meter that with more fancier ones, but most, most ones we use are not fancy. So it uses a, a negative pressure or vacuum to pull, the assist, pull it up. Very, very efficient. Here's another drawing of one that's more like what you'd see. Um, concentrated system here. Um, the water's flowing through here, and it pulls the concentration through this system. And how the water gets here is actually, the vacuum is created, is, is not so much a vacuum, but more a differential pressure in the system that draws the fertilizer. And the atmospheric pressure is actually pushing the water through the system because we have a negative pressure. So probably the most common one is uh, the siphon hose or hose on. Um, this is about 15 bucks. It's a piece of bronze. It's got a check valve in here. It's got a venturi. Uh, hooks onto your water faucet. Um, this happens to be the one I have at home. I use it for just about everything. It's inexpensive. It injects at a constant rate. Uh, the siphon hose brand is 16 to 1. So if you have, that, that's basically one ounce per 16 ounces. Uh, one ounce to generate 16 ounces, which is the easiest way to think about it. We use this uh, for fertilizers. Uh, but a lot of people use this to apply fungicides. This one is very easy to use, very adaptable for pesticide application or for just putting out bleach or something like that. Um, because it's inexpensive, 
Um, and because it's got very few moving parts, it's easy to use. However, once you put this on a water faucet and the end of what's on the other side of the hose, even if it's just fertilizer, that hose is, you know, please don't drink water in a greenhouse. Never drink water in a greenhouse. Bring your own water bottle. Um, and in fact, when I use this at home, I always put a vacuum airlock, a vacuum breaker, in, in between this and the faucet because if you were to get um, a water break or something like that, it would pull all the chemical back into your potable water system. So I always use uh, some sort of an airlock. In fact, the city of Fort Collins requires it on all ir outdoor irrigation systems. They're cheap, inexpensive. I have known very successful greenhouses, greenhouse operations of considerable size, that this is the most elaborate piece of technology they use. It's really quite well, works really quite well. Problem with it though, is when we constrict that aperture, when we constrict that water flow to pull that vacuum, there's a tremendous amount of water pressure loss. So now we don't have, you have to actually use a different size breaker to get a full water distribution. So they don't work quite as well as far as water pressure. So there is a drawback. It's simple, no moving parts, it's cheap. We can use it for lots of different chemicals. It'll do wettable powders quite well as long as we continue to stir it because it doesn't, ha it, it's not, doesn't have moving parts where the wettable powders uh, or can, can cause clogging or anything like that. Um, back pressure, you have to have a check valve. Um, you can't, these do not work well with a water hose that's longer than 50 feet and there is a drastic water pressure, you need to have at least 35 pounds per square inch in your water system to make it work. Uh, standard uh, municipal water systems run about 80, 80 PSI. The next family of injectors are positive displacement injectors. And these are typically some sort of a water pump. Um, as the flow of the water, it actuates a pump and a piston with a series of valves. And they, the advantage of the positive displacement pumps is they'll work on varying water pressures and they'll change themselves according to the meeting rate based upon the watering pressure and flow rate. Uh, you can get some that are mechanically powered. Uh, the injector ratios are typically uh, easy to modify, even when you're, you, can, you can adjust them. And the limiting power is that you have to have at least a certain amount of water flow, and then sometimes they don't go past certain pressures. The old tried and true system is what we call the Smith Measure Mix. You'll still see these in the market some places. This is actually a 100-pound piece of bronze. Uh, it's a water-driven pump. It's got a, a pump in here that drives a set of pistons. This particular one is cast metal, stainless steel. These typically are factory set injection rates, 1 to 100 or 1 to 200. Uh, some of them do have little metering ports that you can change, or you can change out the, the metering device to change your injection ratio. They're water driven. Uh, some have what we call a dual head injection. And we'll talk about this when we talk about water quality and water uh, fertilizers such as that. Some chemicals are not compatible in the same fertilizer concentrate drum. And we usually call it tank A and tank B. Can you think of some fertilizers that may not be compatible together if we had in concentrated form? Calcium and uh, sulfur? Calcium and sulfur. So if you've got calcium as a cation and sulfur or sulfate as the anion, and so for instance, if we had magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salts, and calcium nitrate, we put those together in concentrated form, the salts go into solution, what's going to happen? Precipitate calcium and sulfate will join together. 
into a uh, complex molecule, float to the bottom, and we have a nice layer of drywall on the bottom of our tank. Now, when I say they're not compatible, it doesn't mean they're going to blow up. It just means that they're going to, they like one another, and they're going to join together, and they're going to precipitate and fall out and clog the system. So what we do is we put them in separate tanks in their concentrated form. Then when we inject the two together, by the time it gets to the fertilizer system, well, first of all, the concentration is so low in the, fertilizer, in the irrigation line that they're not going to find each other and precipitate, but get to the pot before anything would happen anyway. So that's a real common example. Another common example of an injector system is the dosatron. Uh, I don't have a picture of a dosmatic, but they're very similar. Um, I personally use dosatron because the, the woman that owns the company is very good to uh, education and that she gives us discount and repair parts for cheap, usually. The problem is uh, they're, they're made out of polymer or plastic, ABS plastic. Uh, it's a water-driven system. And this particular example is, is installed in line, directly in line in the water. A um, couple of things you should think about when you install these things. If you've ever put one in and had to take one out and fix it, you learn real quick why you use things like quick couple unions. And then this is an anti-backflow valve so that I don't get water moving backwards into the system. So we typically apply these in line. Um, we have them in the greenhouses here. Uh, you know when they work, because they click as they work. And they get a little pressure release valve on the top if they get stuck. Pretty easy. You can put multiple heads in line for multiple systems. So this would be an example of a dual head irrigation, dual head for different chemicals. Um, this particular one, we've got it coming out of one bucket. And the reason why I have it coming out of one bucket is I needed a higher fertilizer concentration in the system than I could get with one by itself. Because at certain concentrations, fertilizers just don't go into solution. You, get it too, you, you hit the point of saturation. Fertilizers are a salt. When you deserve a, dissolve a fertilizer into water, what happens to the water? Water temperature does what? Fertilizer salt dissolves into the water. The water temperature goes down. Remember, Dr. Hughes is making ice cream today. You put the salt in there to freeze the system. Okay. It's an endothermic reaction. Oh, I do. These are, this is the dosomatic brand, and here they've got these lined up to inject into a water system that's very large so they can get a larger volume. And for a multi-head system for a larger volume of fertilizer, it was cheaper for them to, to use these polymer-based rather than getting a, a multi-head system. Wait, the multi-head system that most people use is called the Anderson Ratio Feeder. Um, where you buy individual heads and you build it in components. It's cast metal, it's polymer, it's a modular injection system. I've seen modular injection systems that have, what some people will actually do is they'll use these multiple head injection systems to have individual elements to blend and they can computer program it to go to different crops. So. It's a positive displacement system. The modular inject, the Modular heads are over here. We have an expansion tank. And this particular system requires a water meter uh, that controls, uh, that uses a metering device that monitors the, um, there's an electronic uh, metering device up here that actually records the electrical conductivity of the solution to make sure it's got the fertilizer injection right. So we've gone from the siphon hose which is the old beater bicycle all the way to the Porsche. So. so the Anderson injection system um, relies on the water flow in. We have a water motor, which is typically the water motor in this particular device is electric. You, to take it into the injection head, the injection head picks up the fertilizer system mixing tank where it 
comes together and we have the, water, uh, syst the fertilizer system comes out. Here's a picture of that electronic control ratio feeder metering device and uh, it's, uh, this particular one is maintaining the electrical conductivity of the solution at 2.5 decisiemens per meter, if you can read that particular instrument. This is a photograph from uh, Gully Greenhouses. The next kind of positive displacement injector is, is what we, uh, a common one is a GIWA. And there are several other brands. And what this system has, again, has no moving parts, but it uses water pressure to inject the system, inject the fertilizer. It's a positive displacement system, but yet there are no pumps. Now the way the GIWA works, and here's a, an example of it, it's made out of cast steel. And uh, they, they make them everywhere from 20 gallons all the way up to hundreds of gallons. And the water flow comes in, and we have water flow out. But we also, some of the water flow comes in, actually takes in a chamber inside this steel chamber. And inside, within here, we also have a, a bladder. And the internal bladder is where we put our fertilizer concentrate. The water pressure in then pressurizes that bladder. And as the bladder pressurizes, it pushes the fertilizer up into a mixing chamber. And the mixing chamber then has a metering device that controls how much of that fertilizer goes into the mixing chamber. And here you can see the uh, on this photograph on the left, you can see the little white dial on the top. That's the, the metering device to control it. And then we get our concentration out. These are commonly used um, in nurseries where we need to have portable systems where we want to do a fertilizer injection. Um, like I said, no moving parts. Uh, it works quite well. This system is pressurized. One of the things I uh, will make a little, give you a little caveat on this particular device. Um, I've used to use these quite a lot, and they typically have a little glass cylinder, a little view view glass that you can see to see if your fertilizer is um, ha you have plenty of fertilizer in the solution. One of the catches with this thing, and one of the things you need to remember if you ever use one of these, is the system is pressurized. Most of our fertilizers that we use in greenhouses have a dye blended with them. It's usually blue or something like that. And to tell you that you've got fertilizer in the water. Well, one day I was taking one of these apart to fix something and I neglected to remember that it was pressurized. Here's a little release valve down here to drain it out. And when it's pressurized and you're bending over it, the blue fertilizer all comes up. And I wear glasses, and for about two weeks, I had white eyes and a blue face. <laughs> I was the first blue man group member. <laughs> if I ever tell you to do something that sounds really stupid, I've probably done it. <laughs> so which fertilizer is best for you? I mean, which injector is best for you? Why? It's up to you. I've seen all of these devices used in all different scales. Uh, if you've got a large greenhouse, you probably want to consider maybe a permanent installation with the Anderson type system or something like that. Um, you can probably get away with smaller uh, units. Uh, even some of the biggest greenhouses I know would rather have a portable system on a cart so they can custom feed different, different systems. You need to know how much, what your water flow rate is, know what your injector ratios you need, what's your water pressure like, what's your water quality like, because different products work under different systems, how big of a stock tank you need, whether you need to have uh, a stock tank that doesn't let sunlight in to prevent algae growth on your fertilizer. Is that what's going on right now? In, uh, is that what, oh yes. Actually, those, yeah, those are, those, that particular project, the uh, algae growth is pretty intense because we can't put any 
algicides or disinfectants in the water system because it is a study on bacterial contamination. So we're just going to have to live with the algae. You're not going to cover no. your tanks then, just live with it? I thought somebody was going to cover the tanks. Uh, anyway, ease of repair, how e available are the parts, all those sorts of things. Other things you need to think about when you're putting them in, permanently installed injectors need to be plumbed off the main water line. And here's a couple of different examples, like the bypass system. Um, I, I'm a strong proponent of being able to have a bypass system where you can easily convert your irrigation system to clear water versus uh, fertilizer water. And we've got a valve here. Uh, you just have to have a check valve so that we don't get back water going through the system. So this is a bypass system. This is a series in line, or this is a parallel system. And which one works for you? The parallel system might work really good if you wanted to have a dual injection system, but maybe at some point you wanted to close this one off and use just this one. It just depends on how you want to do. And this is actually some of the fun stuff you can do in putting together greenhouse uh, systems. Here's a chart um, that, and you can download this chart off the, the RAM CT site, kind of gives you an idea of the different fertilizer compatibilities. We have urea, ammonium sulfate, all the way through nitric acid. If it's red, that means they're going to precipitate out. If it's yellow, that means there's a high likelihood of some precipitation. If there's no color, um, then you can pretty much put those products together. And it's not so much, they're not explosive, they're not going to cause a problem, it's more precipitation. The chemicals are just not compatible in those concentration tanks. When you, and that's why we have the dual tank system. Acids are uh, commonly injected in our irrigation water for carbonate control. Um, acid injection requires pumps, uh, dosing pumps that are specifically designed for acids. And this is a chemical dosing pump. Um, these are quite a lot more expensive than the typical fertilizer injectors, but it's built to handle things like sulfuric acid. And this particular device here is also controlled by this metering device that uh, determines the amount of acid to be injected in the water to control the carbonates. Another thing that's very important that if you, the minute you put an injection system on, a, on an irrigation system, you must put in a backflow system. Now, this backflow system is installed in a very large greenhouse. It's a double backflow system. I mean, those check, that series of check valves there, just, just to buy the check valves is several thousand dollars. Um, and it's on a um, two-inch water main coming into the property. What are we protecting with a backflow system? Are we protecting our property? No, we're not protecting our property. We're protecting the people on the domestic water supply. Now, when are we going to have problems with the domestic water supply? Is it going to be our problem? No. On the, on the downstream side, we're going to be applying fungicides, pesticides, fertilizers, who knows what. But what's going to happen is when some thing happens downstream, you all have heard about what's called a boil, a boil alert. We have a boil alert. Why do we have a boil alert? Because somebody has cut a water line somewhere. It's usually a contractor on a backhoe, something like that. And when that goes through that system, the whole system depressurizes. Yes? A boil alert. If you get a boil alert, you'll get a reverse 911 call. Boil alert tells you that you can't drink the water without boiling it. It's a good question. We don't see those very often in Colorado. But some of us have lived in other parts of the country where boil alerts are fairly common. You'll get them after hurricanes. After hurricanes and stuff like that, yeah. Because what happens when the water system depressurizes, the water comes back out of 
every user back into the water system. So we have to make sure that the water, if there's a, uh, we have a pressure loss somewhere downstream, that we don't pull water back into the system inadvertently. And that's what they're for. That's why we have them on our uh, irrigation systems, in our lawns and uh, systems. Uh, so uh, those are airlock backflow prevention systems. And what happens is when the water pressure goes off, spring opens up a valve, and there's no way, there's, there's an air interruption. So they're all different kinds. Um, most, most people use, this is called an ASME, uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineer uh, tested certified systems. And in fact, you'll see in our greenhouses on campus that we have them everywhere. And uh, for instance, there's two or three at Perk. There's several over in the university greenhouses. And everything that's on the downstream side of those backflow, pre backflow prevention systems is considered non-potable water. So we're trying to protect the potable water supply. Filtration, if you're using surface water, for instance, if you're taking water off of a pond, let's say you're a nursery greenhouse operation, you have, you're, you're have water uh, ponds, you need to filter the water either with a screen system, a, a mesh, or maybe you're gonna use a uh, multimedia filtration system like this one here, which is a um, uh, custom designed water filter that's installed in a greenhouse. And what they do is they, the company that that installs the filtration system, comes in and evaluates what the water quality is like, what kind of particulates you need to filter out, and then it'll design in. It's got a mixture of different materials such as garnet, sand, um, activated charcoal, uh, depending on different particle size, depending on what kind of products you need to filter out. Now what's great about this particular system, this is one that's called a self-flushing, and this over here, we have a little chamber, and there's a valve here and a valve here on the top. And what it does measures when there's a pressure differential, in other words, it's starting to get clogged up, and there's a pressure differential, this thing will self-flush itself, reverse the water flow to, to take the garbage out and the gunk out, so it doesn't have to be serviced. And those are pretty common. In fact, that particular one's at Jordan's greenhouse. What would something like that cost? System like that cost? Everything costs lots of money. Um, that's probably a $20,000 installation. Water hammer. Water hammer is uh, something that we see in greenhouses pretty regular. Uh, one of the things we do is we use uh, quarter turn valves because uh, we don't want to sit there and have our employees turning a water hose on going do 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 turn, 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 when it's easier just to turn it on and go about and do the work. Anything that you can speed up the operation, make it more convenient, makes watering easier to use. But now that we have quarter turn valves and using valves that are on, off, on, off all the time, we run into a problem called water hammer. And the first time I ran into it is I built a, a, a mist line and I used garden hoses to connect the mist line to the, to the valve uh, and it was on, off, on and off. And with about two weeks, had a big old bubble on the side of the water hose and it exploded because water hammer on off on off on a short run disrupted the hose that on off on off on off is really hard on equipment especially polymer constructed injectors like the dosatron and the dosomatic in other words after a while if you have them out in the greenhouse you get a little sunlight on the plastic the plastic starts to fatigue that on off pressure differential will eventually crack the casing so we use what's called a water hammer arrester. And this is a particular example. And what water hammer is, is basically a ricochet effect. So we've got water flowing through a water line, and city water pressure is 80 pounds per square inch. And we shut it off immediately. The water hits the end of that line at, 100, at 80 pounds per square inch, pushes it back at 80 pounds per square inch. We've got water coming back in at 80 pounds per square inch. All of a sudden, we have 160 pounds per square inch of water pressure. Bang. You've all heard it before in your apartment with copper pipes. Turn the dishwasher on and off, turn the washing machine on and off, and it goes, you hear the pipe somewhere in the house going da 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 
da da da da da That is water hammer. It's hard on the systems. Steel, metal pipes, eventually it's going to, uh, perhaps if you have a copper sweat that's not been sweated correctly, the union isn't correct, it's going to split. So what we do is we, this is a water hammer arrestor. They cost about, this one particular one costs about 30 bucks. It's got a bladder inside of it that's charged with air. We plug it into the water system. And what it does when we turn the water on and off, that bladder takes in the shock. Um, almost every plumber in a modern home will put one of these on something like this, a water hammer arrestor on the hot water heater. It extends the life of a hot water heater about 10 years. So we want to use these particular things, and I use them pretty regularly to protect our injector systems. I'm sorry? What's a lifespan on one of those? Lifespan on one of those? I've never replaced one. I don't know. I've got some I've been using for 10, 15 years. So all I know is they increase the lifespan of my injectors markedly. And the lady that owns Dosatron is the one that taught me how to use it. So Dosatron is a woman-owned company. Uh, Leela Kelly is the owner, and um, so forth. Now, injectors are mechanical devices. They change. They have to be calibrated periodically. There's a couple ways you can do it. Like here's a three-line injector. Got a filtration system. You can see their bypass. Um, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it with a volume ratio method, or you can use electrical conductivity. The equipment that you need to calibrate a, an injector, um, a graduated cylinder, one to two liters is best, uh, a large container with a fixed volume, five gallon bucket, your hoses. Put the siphon hose into the graduated cylinder, operate the system at the injector at the normal pressure, allow it to empty that specific volume from the graduated cylinder and run it till this run the system and just measure the uptake of the volume and the discharge volume and you can calculate your ratio now you can either tweak like the dosomatic and the dosatron you can actually tweak the, um, the 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 injector itself to adjust it to the exact ratio you want or you can mathematically modify your fertilizer concentration based on the injection ratio that you have So injection ratio, volume output. So for instance, here's an example where five gallons or 18,925 milliliters takes up 370 milliliters. Our injection ratio is 1 to 51. This is not rocket science. To do that, you need to know how to calculate parts per million. And parts per million is something that we always use in the greenhouses. And typically, if somebody says that I'm fertilizing my crop at 200 parts per million, they're actually, what they're saying is I'm using 200 parts per million nitrogen, because they always, typically everything's based upon nitrogen, because nitrogen is the element that is used in the highest volume. And uh, fertilizer rates are based on parts per million. Now, most fertilizers, fertilizer companies, especially companies like Peters, like Jack Peters, like um, O.M. Scott, they're going to have a table on that bag to teach you how to do this. But you can do this on your own. It's pretty easy. Um, those of you who had greenhouse management have been through this before. Guess what? You're going to do it again. Um, the easiest way to do it is, is using a formula that we call the Quick 75. And the Quick 75 has got to be the easiest fertilizer formula that you'll ever learn. What we do is we calculate the amount, to calculate the amount of fertilizer we need, we take the desired part per million, divide it by 75, then divide that number by the decimal fraction. So if it's like, what's a decimal fraction? If it's 20, 20, 20, 
the decimal fraction is 0 0.2. 20 refers to 20% or 0.2, okay? Uh, whatever fertilizer we're wanting to do. So there's your formula. Now this quick 75, the desired part per million divided by 75 divided by the decimal fraction yields how much fertilizer we want to apply in ounces, dry weight, of fertilizer to be dissolved in 100 gallons of water. One point, I wanted to know where it came from. Where does quick 75 come from? Or what is a part per million? A part per million, a lot of different things. That's the same thing as one little crystal of salt. One part per million is one crystal of salt in a five pound bag of salt or a drop in 16 gallons. But it's not necessarily liquid, an inch in 158 miles. One minute, 1.9 years, a pound in 500 tons, or a penny in $10,000. So let's do a quick calculation. So we're going to calculate 100 pounds. Well, let's show you how this where this came from in a quick calculation. To calculate part per million, 100 gallons of water, one part per million. So you take, multiply 100 gallons times 8.34 pounds per gallon. A pound of water weighs 8.34 pounds. You know, for those of you who want to weight lift, go get a couple of gallon jugs of milk, right? Eight so if we got 100 gallons, that weighs 834 pounds, 834 pounds times 16 ounces per pound, 16 ounces per pound. How many liquid ounces are in a gallon? How many? 128, OK. How many tablespoons is that? Trick question. So that means there's a 13,344 ounces per 100 gallons. So 13,344 ounces per 13 billion, 344,000 ounces equals one part per million, or 0.013344 per 100 gallons to equal one part per million. Somebody's a math nerd. So here we look at it. That's how I came up with these calculations. 100 gallons times 8.34, 834 pounds, 834 pounds times 16 ounces per pound, 13,344 ounces. 13,344 ounces per 100 gallons. That's missing the one. Equals one part per million. Just move the decimal point around. Multiply times the desired part per million comes out to 74.94, or rounded up, it comes to 75. That's where that formula came from. Somebody smarter than me. So how do we use it? 200 parts per million nitrogen from ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate, which is 33% nitrogen. Unfortunately, nobody can buy ammonium nitrate anymore because if you buy ammonium nitrate, you're automatically considered to be a terrorist. Because if you take a 50-pound 50 50 bag of ammonium nitrate and saturate it with diesel fuel, you now have enough explosive to blow up a major beaver dam. I used to work for a guy that he would take that ammonium nitrate bag, soak it with diesel fuel, put a blasting cap in it, go off and boom. That's how the um, Civic Center in Oklahoma City was, ex was blown up, blown up with a U-Haul trailer full, U-Haul truck full of ammonium nitrate with that. So now you can buy, if you buy ammonium nitrate today, you have to buy it formulated as a, as a, a liquid mix that you can use. Um, but anyway, take 200 parts per million divided by 75, which gives you 
Divide that by 0.33, which is the 33% nitrogen. The answer is 8.09, or we blend 8.09 ounces, which is half a pound, into 100 gallons of water will give us 200 parts per million nitrogen. But I'm going to put that in an injector because I don't have a big tank. So I'm going to make this into an injector. So I got 50 gallons in my injector, for example. That's a 50 gallon drum, okay? Got an injector with a 1 to 100 fixed ratio. 99 parts of water come this way times 50, because it's a 50 gallon concentrate. Fifty gallons of concentrate. It's going to yield five thousand gallons. Four thousand nine fifty is coming in plus fifty to equal five thousand gallons. So to get that, I'm going to take my put in. 404.5 ounces, because it's 500. So all I have to do is multiply the whole thing times 500, because the quick 75 comes out in 100 per 100 gallons of water. So we take that, multiply it times that to, to make it equal out, puts in 404.5 ounces, or 25 pounds, which is a sack of fertilizer. Just happens to come out that way with this particular example. You still want a table? Isn't metric exponentially easier? Is metric exponentially easier? Absolutely exponentially easier. Because all you're doing is moving around decimal points. But our culture is still stuck in the ounces and pounds and gallons and all that sort of thing. So that's where we go. So, so here is an example of a table for a fertilizer to make stock solutions to provide, we have the different percentages of nitrogen in the fertilizer. So here's 33.5, which is ammonium nitrate. I lied to you, it's actually 33.5%. And you can, for a siphon hose, which is 1 to 16 or 1 to 12, depending on the brand you use, over here to 4, 8.1. And these tables are on the bag which is always convenient until the bag gets wet. <laughs> and here's another table with soluble salt readings. For instance, you can use the total soluble salt meter uh, or electrical conductivity and you can measure it. The problem with tables is we have nitrogen, ammonium, nitrate. These are all single element cations. Go to mixed analysis. Now we have brands. And we get into our brand names. Guess what? Electrical conductivity is different for the brands based on what all the kind of other kind of stuff they put into their fertilizer. <laughs>